Hermeticism is a branch of spirituality that doesn't yet have enough mainstream visibility and exposition, partly because of its scattered history and missing texts. But finally, at present time we've recollected a substantial amount of the ancient materials, and if there was any spiritual path for the people of the Western world, in keeping with the rational philosophical spirit of the Greeks, it would be Hermeticism. So in this video, I'm going to share with you 10 essential Hermetic texts that you should read or at least know about. Let's do it. I'm going to split these into two parts. Five primary texts and five secondary texts, where the primary ones are the ancient authentic source material, and the secondary are derivatives or reworkings of that older material, but still significant and valuable in their philosophical impact. We're going to start off with the best of the best, the Corpus Hermeticum. And as far as I can tell, this legendary spiritual work kicked things off for the widespread rediscovery of Hermeticism. In the 1400s, the famous Cosimo de' Medici of Florence, Italy, commissioned people to go exploring for lost wisdom manuscripts. And one monk, Leonardo of Pistoia, came back with this treasure from Macedonia, a then 14-part Greek manuscript which was eventually dated back to 1st through 3rd century origin. It was swiftly translated into Latin by Marsilio Ficino, who was in the midst of working on the equally important Greek works of Plato at the time. And believe it or not, once published, this actually created quite a stir in Christian Europe, because people regarded Hermes as another prominent prophet of antiquity, like Moses and Jesus, and his teachings had already been known and quoted for centuries, even by Christians. Anyway, we now have this great 1999 updated English translation, which I recommend, that includes 16 out of the sometimes 18 sermons nowadays included in the corpus. This is an essential read for people on the spiritual path, and really anyone who's seeking to truly understand what is meant by the term God. Its style appeals to logic, as if you're reading Greek philosophy like Plato. It's definitely not the mystical chakra type spirituality. The main premise of these teachings is that there is an ultimate reality called the Supreme Good, the All, Father God, and Nous. And since it encompasses all things, we as individuals necessarily possess this as our real fundamental nature. So it's something we can gain experiential realization of through spiritual training. Of particular interest in this translation is the word nous, which normally means mind in Greek, but when skillfully left untranslated, we see it more as meaning divine awareness, both as it appears within man and as another term for the ultimate. To quote from Corpus Hermeticum 11, to be able to know and to will and to hope is the straight and easy way appropriate to each that will lead to the supreme good. When you take that road, this good will meet you everywhere and will be experienced everywhere, for there is nothing which it is not. Another quote from Sermon 13, The Way of Rebirth, He who is born from God is of a different kind. He is a son of God and himself God. In all, he is the all, composed of all powers. I am not now what I was before, for I have been born in Nous. So I have no interest in my former physical form, for I am without color and cannot be touched or measured. I am a stranger to these. The mortal form changes day by day with the turning of time. It grows and decays, its reality is a deception. Withdraw into yourself, and it shall come. Will, and it is so. Make idle the senses of the body, and the spirit will be born. This constitutes the manner and the teaching of rebirth. I'd call this an advanced text, so I don't necessarily recommend starting with this unless you are a go-getter and you're ready for the challenge, but I will show casual readers what I do recommend later on. Number two, the perfect discourse, Logos Teleos, also known as the Asclepius. It took me a while to discover this one, and in fact, I only found it because I was reading the Nag Hammadi library and a Coptic excerpt from this work appears in the Sixth Codex. The scholar's introduction to this excerpt mentioned how this one is a more of a literal translation to the Greek original, which is now lost, than the Latin Asclepius. So all of that got me interested in trying to find the full text. This is the second major Hermetic work important for the spiritual path, at a length of 45 pages, likely originally produced between 100 and 300 AD. As for the overview and themes, Hermes summons his three usual disciples, Asclepius, Tat, and Amon, to listen to a wisdom lecture that is sure to be one of his best, because he's feeling particularly divinely inspired today. Unlike the corpus, this is all one continuous lecture, so it's much more smooth to read and the teachings are less technical, so I feel it's more easily understandable. 
Per usual, he explains the nature of the divine via a variety of subjects and the path for man to realize this nature within himself. Of particular curiosity is his prophecy about the future demise and misunderstanding of the Egyptian religion, which suggests an origin in dynastic Egypt. Now be entirely present as far as your mind and ability are capable, for the knowledge of God is to be attained by a godlike concentration of consciousness. Such knowledge comes like a rushing river tumbling in flux from above to the depths beneath. An important spiritual point because we know from Buddhism and Hinduism that practicing samadhi concentration is indeed an essential part of the path to realization. For that goodness indeed seems perfect when it is protected by the virtue of despising the desire for everything else. That is why they are called possessions. All things of this kind are foreign to a man, including the body. Thus, we must despise not only those things which we grasp at, but also the very source within us from which the grasping comes. This is another very Buddhist teaching, viewing phenomena as inconstant and not self, as a meditative practice to release the root of craving and propel one towards the inner Buddha nature. He doesn't literally mean despise like conjuring negative emotions though, so much as a mindset of intelligently rejecting in favor of attaining the supreme good. And to prove this to you, on the previous page he says, to love the God of heaven and all that pertains to him is nothing but continual reverence for every thing. Number three, the discourse on the eighth and ninth. This is the third major hermetic work and is yet another part of the Nag Hammadi library discovered in 1945. Not surprisingly, it's in the same codex written in Coptic with the original Greek dating back to the second century. This one is shorter than the others, only six pages and a bit more challenging to extract value from, but it's unique in that it focuses on the initiatory tradition surrounding hermeticism and we get a bit of imagery about their location in Egypt. We can get into the main content of this one by looking at the title. The student questions Hermes about the final steps of the spiritual path, gaining enlightenment, phrased as the eighth and ninth stages. Another term for this is the Ogdoad and Ennead, which as you may know if you study Egyptian mythology is first of all an important concept that describes two sets of gods. And this is even alluded to on the last page when he describes the temple of Diospolis Magna. Eight guards watch over it, with nine of the sun. But in its spiritual sense here and in some other Gnostic texts, it's representative of the planes of divine realization, having surpassed the seven planetary spheres of conditioned reality, where the ninth sphere is construed as total union with God, aka the self-begotten, beyond which is the unbegotten, like Ein in Kabbalah. For example, we get some insight from the prayer that Hermes and his unnamed student recite. Lord, grant us wisdom from your power that reaches us, that we may relate to ourselves the vision of the eighth and ninth. Already we have advanced to the seventh, since we are faithful and abide in your law. Your will we have fulfilled always. We have walked in your way and ever renounced evil, so the vision may come. Grant that through spirit we may see the form of the image that lacks nothing, and accept the reflection of the fullness. And then we get more insight from Hermes' vision after the prayer. How shall I tell you about the all? I am Nous. I have found the beginning of the power of all powers without beginning. Language cannot reveal this. For all of the eighth, my child, and the souls in it and the angels sing a hymn in silence. I mind understand. Number four, the prayer of thanksgiving. Though this one is extremely short and more of an add-on, I'm going to include the prayer of thanksgiving a two-page Coptic prayer that comes right after the discourse on the 8th and 9th. And the importance of this one is that it's something you see in the Hermetic literature, these recurrent wisdom prayers that occur during or at the end of discourses, like we just saw in the last one. For example, it also occurs at the end of the Asclepius, there's a similar prayer section in Corpus Hermeticum 13, and it's also found in certain Greek magical papyri. Here's an excerpt. O name free of trouble, Honored with the designation God, praised with the designation Father, to all and all things come fatherly kindness and affection and love. And if there is sweet and simple instruction, it grants us mind, word, and knowledge. Mind that we may understand you, word that we may interpret you, knowledge that we may know you. Number five, the definitions from Hermes Trismegistus to Asclepius. The first ever English translation of this is actually included as the second part of the Way of Hermes book I showed you. And this work was only rediscovered recently around 1956, so that's exciting. In translator Jean-Pierre Mahé's introduction, he says the work has mainly been preserved in a 6th century Armenian translation, 
but the Greek original likely goes back to the first century, and it's even possible the definitions predate the other Hermetic works. This one is nine pages with ten sections, and it consists of condensed phrases of the Hermetic knowledge, likely for the purpose of memorization, for recalling the lessons of lectures, and also for meditation, mental development. Mahe says these definitions as a whole can be regarded as a general outline of hermetic spiritual exercises aimed at developing individual noose. I'm not the biggest fan of this as reading material. It definitely leans towards being used as spiritual tools, but it does make a good capstone to the Corpus Hermeticum, and it could help you clarify some of the concepts in it. Nothing is uninhabited by God. For where heaven is, God is too. And where the world is, heaven is too. God is the good which is previous to all the intelligible beings. God is the father of the intelligible. Heaven is the maker of the body. God is within himself. The world is in God, and man in the world. Man's deficiency is ignorance. His plenitude is the knowledge of God. Now for what I call the secondary hermetic texts. The most significant of these, in that it's closest to the actual time period of the originals, is called the Stobaeus. The backstory with this is pretty cool. The man Joannes Stobaeus from Macedonia collected and organized a bunch of useful life wisdom from over 500 philosophers and writers to hand down to his son, probably around 5th century. We call it the Anthology, but the original title was probably Four Books of Extracts, Sayings, and Precepts. Apparently, he quoted extensively from Hermetic writings, including the Corpus, the Asclepius, and many writings I don't recognize, numbered up to Extract 27 or 29. I don't know what percentage of these are entirely unique in that we've never seen them before elsewhere, but it could be all of them based on what I've been reading. I particularly find the Sermons of Isis to Horus an interesting addition to the genre. He who pursues philosophy to its highest degree will learn where reality is, and what it is, and having learnt this, he will be yet more pious, and thenceforward it will be impossible for him to fall away from the good. For never, my son, can a soul that has so far uplifted itself as to grasp the truly good and real slip back to the evil and unreal. For the soul acquires a wondrous yearning for the good and oblivion of all evils, when it has learnt to know its own forefather. This, my son, is the consummation of piety, and when you have attained to it, you will live your life aright and be blessed in your death. For those who study the spiritual path, you'll know that this fits the description of enlightenment, the stream entry of Buddhism, very accurately in that it's a permanent revolutionizing experience that thenceforth you can't fall away from, meaning back into deluded, unvirtuous ways or a decline of consciousness. You're destined to achieve complete enlightenment sooner or later, even if it takes seven more lifetimes. Next is the famous Emerald Tablet of Hermes, or Tabula Smaragdina. The earliest version we have of this is 8th century in Arabic. It's not a standalone though, it's part of a larger book called The Secret of Creation and the Art of Nature. The reason it gets its name is because in that frame story, the character finds a chamber below a statue of Hermes in the city of Tyana, and there's a body on a golden throne holding an emerald tablet with these words written on it. This work was later translated into Latin in the 12th century, so the emerald tablet within was translated along with it. Several varying versions arose, but the one in Liber Hermetis de Alchemia became the most widely used. And notably, Sir Isaac Newton translated his own copy in the 1600s from the Nuremberg edition. The content gives a succinct overview of recognizable hermetic themes. Tis true without falsehood, certain and most true. That which is above is like that which is below, and what is below is like that which is above, to accomplish the miracle of the one thing. And just as all things have been and arose from the meditation of one, so do all created things originate from this one thing through adaptation. That's just a small piece of it, but you can easily look up the full thing online. Number 8. The Kabbalion. Written in 1908 by three initiates, this is the work that popularized the seven hermetic principles, and I cover this extensively in my recent video. So go check that out if you want to see a complete overview of the concepts. In their introduction, they claim that this is a summary of the ancient oral hermetic tradition called the Kabbalion, and their astute teachings definitely support that claim. But in short, it outlines the basic aspects of the spiritual path, whose main feature is called mental transmutation or alchemy. And we use the wisdom teachings, such as the seven hermetic principles, as tools of development to approach unity with the all. 
If you've read it, you know it definitely deserves to be in this list as an influential work. And when you read the other Hermetic teachings, you can detect the seven principles as major themes throughout. So I recommend reading this as a good starting point so you can get the most out of reading the other more complex Hermetic writings. Number nine, The Hermetica. This 1997 book isn't a new work so much as a highly organized and simple collection of the Hermetic teachings by the two authors. They did a great job of organizing the teachings into specific themes, and they poetically craft each chapter by drawing upon several Hermetic texts to create a concise new message and presentation of the ideas. Each chapter is short and presented in a stanza format, and it's a great quick way to take in the Hermetic philosophies in addition to the immensely useful introduction about the history of Hermeticism. So I also recommend reading this book as one of the first you should read besides the Kabbalion, if you want to start simple. At the end of the book, you can see a chart of the resource breakdown for each chapter. Plus, one of the sources they use is in fact the elusive Stobaeus. So the benefit is, you get to experience all these various sources without buying them all and individually reading each one. And one last point I liked before I share an example quote is how they translate God as Atum, in keeping with the Egyptian origin. Atum, if you don't know, is one of the primordial Egyptian gods from the aforementioned Ennead, from which the rest of the more famous Egyptian pantheon proceeds. So out of all the Egyptian gods you've heard of, Atum is one of the best matches to the Christian father god concept. I find this to be an important move because using fresh words uncluttered with associations allows for the creation of new understanding and perspective you wouldn't otherwise get, just as the translators did for Nous in the Corpus Hermeticum. Now here's a great quote from the last chapter. Have I anything which is mine? Am I other than you? You are all that I am, do, and say. You are all that happens. You are all that has not occurred. You are mind in your thinking. You are father in your creating. You are Atum who does everything. You are primal goodness everywhere. While I am still in the body, you have made me a god by the gift of your eternal life. And I am filled with joy. And I no longer see with bodily eyes, but witness with mind. When a man is born again, he is not a body of three dimensions. He is all mind. Now that I see in mind, I perceive myself to be the all. I am in heaven and in earth. I am the presence which is present everywhere. And last, I'm going to include this one as well. The Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean. I've covered this 1939 book extensively over a trilogy of videos for good reason. And although it alleges to be of dubious mystical origin, I would ask the more skeptical among you to simply view it as an esoteric wisdom novella, which is really an ancient literary tactic where a captivating story is used as a vehicle for presenting spiritual concepts. Here's a relevant quote for Hermeticism. Then I heard the voice, hear and understand. The flame is the source of all things, containing all things in potentiality. The order that sent forth light is the word, and from the word comes life and the existence of all. The life in you is the word. Find the life within you and have power to use of the word. Long I watched the light flame pouring forth from the essence of fire, realizing that life is but order, and that man is one with the fire. Since it bears the namesake of the god Thoth Hermes, and presents many spiritual and hermetic teachings throughout in a philosophically significant way, I'm including it in our list as a worthy secondary source to check out. As a final bonus category, there appears to be a lot of missing texts that are referenced throughout the literature we have. First, of course, we have whatever unknown texts Dobaeus has been quoting from, but in the first three major works I presented, all of them reference general and detailed written lectures that the advanced student should already be familiar with. The scribe at the end of text number four, The Prayer of Thanksgiving, blatantly writes somewhat of an apology, where he's like, I almost feel embarrassed sending this copy to you, because you probably have a surplus of the Hermetic writings like I do. These were clearly very abundant in the early centuries. But the most compelling, which shows we definitely have missing texts to find, Clement of Alexandria and his 2nd century work Stromata claims he knows of 42 Hermetic books that the Egyptian culture uses, 36 of which outline the entirety of the Egyptian philosophy. So is there an undiscovered cachet of Hermetic texts out there, just like the Nag Hammadi Library, waiting to be discovered by some Indiana Jones or haphazard wayfarer? Maybe someday we'll find out. Hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Subscribe and hit the notification bell if you want to see more esoteric topics from me. Leave me a like, and if you want to support my work, consider buying some of my channel t-shirt merch or donating on my Patreon. I'll leave the links for all the books I presented below. Till next time, Trismegistus out.